I'm the host for John Cobb and Friends. We maintain the fiction that our gatherings on Tuesday morning are an extension of John Cobb's living room. Well, uh, we're in a different living room this time. Uh, we are uh, privileged to be in the family room of uh, uh, John and Jackie Gingrich. And uh, we're here to celebrate uh, the uh, gift of uh, John Gingrich to not only the Cobb Institute, but to, uh, to many uh, uh, parts of our lives together. And so that's what we're about today. And uh, we hope as we go along, if you know John well, and you came just especially because of that, uh, we, uh, Jackie would like to see a, a note in the chat that says, hello, I'm so-and-so, and here's my connection, and I'm glad to be here. So we'll have that as a, it's almost like a guest book, Jackie, yes. that folks can Good. sign in on it. And uh, we'll be alert. You'll have a chance to share uh, as we go through the uh, time together. Um, we will have an opportunity. Uh, Jay McDaniel called this the three gifts of uh, John Gingrich. Uh, I took away the three because I think he's got a lot more than three gifts. But today we're going to concentrate on uh, the three things. We're going to concentrate on his educational gift at the University of uh, Laverne, where he spent a decade. And a lot of the people in the living room here with me today are his uh, companions from that journey. Uh, he, he also uh, is a, a musician. And so we'll get to hear uh, him sing. And then uh, his uh, spirituality that grows out of his, uh, his background and his process theology. So uh, that's where we're headed today is a review of his educational and his uh, artistic and his spirituality gifts. So welcome uh, all of you today. And um, you know, it was John Gingrich who announced uh, in February of 2020 at uh, John Cobb's 95th birthday party, our new name, the Cobb Institute, a community for process and practice. And uh, it was just a year ago this week when we learned of this uh, untimely death of John Gingrich. But today we're paying tribute to uh, the one who was the first chairman of the Cobb Institute board. And uh, he spent decades of his life in service of the mission of the University of Laverne <clears throat> and gave uh, a, a lot of effort to helping to form the Cobb Institute. We'd like to... Uh, give you just a brief introduction to what the Cobb Institute is about, uh, especially for some of you that might not be with us uh, often on our John Cobb and Friends sessions each Tuesday morning, where we create adventures that matter. And then after this brief introduction, we'll hear from John Cobb. Uh, the Cobb Institute was named in honor of our founder, John Cobb. And what we do is promote a process relational way of understanding and living in the world it's a philosophical outlook, and as such, it shares wisdom, emphasizes harmony, focuses on the common good. We live out that philosophy by engaging in local initiatives and creating compassionate communities that help build an ecological civilization. That last sentence is a mouthful, but uh, the University of Laverne is among the folks helping us to make this local in projects around Laverne and Claremont, and especially in Pomona, which has declared itself to be a compassionate city. So uh, these sentences are, they're not just words, they're directions for how we live our lives. We're ready for the next slide, Richard. When we first met, John Cobb had 14 tables that you could sign up to as to something you wanted to do for the, what has become the Cobb Institute. <clears throat> Uh, we couldn't quite handle all 14 tables all at once. <laughs> and so uh, we kind of think of three major areas in which we uh, work together, advancing educational possibilities. And of course, John was for a time chairperson of our education uh, work group. Uh, we foster spiritual vitality. And uh, this is a group that works on matters of process and faith. And we'll hear more about uh, the way John Gingrich has dealt with some of that in his local congregation. And then we promote healthy communities. 
uh, and we already mentioned the engagement of the University of Laverne in uh, some of the community projects around what we call the Tri-Cities, Claremont and Laverne and uh, Pomona. So um, this, this is some of the breadth of, of who we are as the Cobb Institute. You can find us easily on uh, not only on uh, Facebook and social media, but we have our own website uh, has a nice, easy uh, site of Cobb.Institute. And uh, you can there at that website uh, engage you know, to join us, uh, get a, a list of our many activities, and you can become a part of, uh, of, of the Institute and to uh, and get regular information from us if you sign up. You can even contribute. We're supposed to let you know that you can contribute not only at the end of the year, but all through the year, we accept money. <laughs> I guess that's enough on that slide, Richard. We're today we're here to celebrate the gifts of John Gingrich. And what a privilege, Jackie, it is to sh share this in your family room with your associates and people that have been close to you and John all these years. John Cobb, I think we're ready to hear from you uh, a, a testimony to, uh, to the life of John. Thank you. I'm okay, you can hear me? Yeah, we hear you. All right. Uh, I really appreciate this arrangement. I'm Unfortunately, I'm going to have to go to a meeting of a board of a sister organization in half an hour and I appreciate the chance to say something while I'm here and I'm also counting on hearing one of at least one musical number. My, my knowledge of his singing, I mean I was vaguely aware of his musical interests but I've only become really aware of them recently and I I think they're quite marvelous. Now, John, you're, we're on it. You'll hear that. Yes, good. good. So uh, I, I want to say that our first connection was when he was a student at the Claremont School of Theology and the Graduate School. And I'm very proud of the fact that I taught him process theology and process theology became a part of his life and his teaching from that time on. And I think he also understood the, 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 wider, the wider meaning of the idea of a process vision and that it emphasizes that everything is connected with everything else. Our modern world has too often built boundaries around things. Academic disciplines are sort of bound, bounded things which don't really interact much with each other. And I think good education is not, not that kind of thing. I think in really good education, we learn to see the way everything is interconnected, all of its complexity. And I, I think John learned some of that from me. So first, I'm just saying what I'm proud of in my relationship with John. But there are so many ways in which John was helpful to me uh, when I, I, I developed a much, I'll, I'll say much warmer sense of the University of Laverne and of the Claremont Colleges, even though, of course, the School of Theology was located immediately adjacent to the Claremont Colleges. And when, um, when needed, some kind of connection with the college of, often turned to Laverne. That was especially true when, when we were losing the School of Theology in Claremont. It seemed it was moving and the center was moving with it. And immediately we thought we needed to establish fuller and more, even more formal relations with the University of Laverne. So uh, my appreciation of that school and my sense of sort of belonging there and 
the connecting there, I certainly owe to, to John Gingrich. We in the process community talk a lot about being holistic. We think it's the hum a human life should be lived in a holistic way. And I'm an extremely poor uh, representative of that ideal. I talk about it a lot. John was almost as, as fine a model of that as I could imagine. I mean, I mean two parts of his life were very highly developed. I think he gets at least an A, if not an A plus on both of them, of music and sports. And I get flat F on both of them. <laughs> <laughs> but those, those are not the only things that I get an F on and that he, he would shine in. But he was a, not only able to work in many fields effectively, not only the ones I've mentioned, but of course, the one that is really most important for this conversation was administration. I've been very good at initiating all kinds of projects, but from the beginning, I always needed somebody else to actually make them happen. It's, it's good to have ideas, but it's even better to be able to actualize them. Beginning with the Center for Process Studies, I'm very proud of my role, but if it had not been for David Griffin, it would have collapsed a long, long time ago. Well, I think it's, you understand that somewhat like my role here, I, I played an initiating role. It was my idea that we should do something in, in Claremont, continuing the process tradition here after the center moved away. And I, in any case, felt that that could be and something in Claremont that was more local than the center process studies. But if it had just been my 14 tables, which were already mentioned, of course, none of them would have amounted to anything. But John was not only a fine teacher and a fine thinker, but he also had had many years of administrative experience. And it was the fact that he was willing to take over responsibility and make something happen out of my wishes and hopes and dreams to which we owe the existence of what at that time we call the Claremont Institute. I'm very honored that he was the one, I guess, I don't know who was initiated the idea of naming, naming it after me. The main reason was the term Claremont Institute was already taken by another, by another institution that we didn't share a great deal with in terms of basic attitudes. But the, uh, to actually make something happen requires a kind of organizational and administrative skill and experience that uh, once again, I, I get a very low grade on that. And I give him a very high grade. I think he made a great contribution to the University of Louvain and others will really have to talk about that. But I can say we owe to him the fact that we actually be, actually organized ourselves into something that could survive. And uh, all that we have done therefore is the fruit of John's leadership. So I'm very happy to be able to pay him this tribute and I'm looking forward to hearing him sing. And I'm sorry, I will not be hearing all of the comments. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, John. And uh, you will hear him sing. Yes. <clears throat> I'd like to introduce uh, uh, Sean uh, Kirshner who is the uh, pianist and the organist at uh, John's uh, home church, the uh, Laverne Church of the Brethren, 
Uh, Sean Kirshner uh, is a person who has great musical gifts himself. In fact, uh, some of your compositions were played at the Walt Disney uh, Pavilion in Los Angeles this very weekend. But uh, Sean is going to be the introducer of our music and, and tell us a little about the musical side of John as he introduces a couple of pieces, but one at a time. Sean? Thank you, Ron. Uh, also, just to introduce myself a little bit more, um, we, we heard talking about turning dreams into actualization just moments ago. And John certainly has played that role in my life. The fact that I'm sitting here in California is exactly due to John, who hired me more than 20 years ago to come out from Chicago to teach at the University of Laverne. So that's one institutional overlap. Um, the church has been mentioned as a second, where we were musical colleagues in the music program for two decades, but also the Los Angeles Master Chorale, the concerts that you alluded to just now were um, on behalf of the Los Angeles Master Call, for which John sang um, in his day, we shared conductors um, and colleagues, but we never sang in the choir at the same time. But I actually have a visual aid here. This is an album that I somehow came into possession of at my home of the Roger Wagner Chorale, which was the first form of the Los Angeles Master Chorale. And John sang for Roger Wagner and also for uh, his successor, Paul Salomonovich, um, who, who I also sang with. Um, but anyway, that's just to introduce a little bit, but let's get onto the main action here, which is to hear John's beautiful baritone voice. John was raised in the Church of the Brethren, a singing tradition. Uh, for its first two centuries, instruments were not allowed. So similar to the Mennonite tradition, uh, the a cappella tradition develops fine singing, fine ears and fine singing. And so we see actually the fruit of that church tradition in John's own talent and gift. But he's going to be singing um, the, the, uh, the Foray Requiem, French composer Gabriel Foray. And toward the end, we have a baritone solo called Libera Me Domine. And we will just hear an excerpt of John singing that now. John's voice, the clarity, and we'll hear more of that in his beautiful diction in some other uh, numbers coming up. But also, I wanted to say just my experience, who also played for John many times as a soloist, is that what made his solo special is that you weren't just getting the delivery of the musical material, but you're getting a presence. And you always sense that with John, he understood the meaning that he was expressing. The deeper dimensions of the solo were always being expressed through him. And that's what I think chiefly gave the sense of gravity and grandeur and power in his singing, because there was always a complete connection with the expressive intent, the meaning, combined with the beauty of his vocal delivery. So, liberame, doesn't that mean free me? 
It does. Oh, he was certainly yes. trained to be a great uh, <laughs> musician. Uh, Jackie, you were telling us a story the other day about how John first got connected to the University of Laverne, and uh, we thought it might be nice if you could share that with us. Yes, I will. And then, and then we'll introduce all these wonderful folks in the room with us. Okay. Welcome, everyone. I'm so glad to see you and so glad to see relatives and friends from all parts of my life. I'm so glad that you've joined us this morning. I met John when I was 17, and as strange as it may seem, at the end of our first date, I knew I wanted to marry this fellow. And I'm so grateful for the 60 years that he was beside me. I called him my rock because he kept me grounded when times were tough. He could almost always make me laugh. And I was just so glad for all the joy that he brought to me all these years. Ron did ask me to share the story of how he became affiliated with the University of Laverne. In 1968, in the summer, John was <clears throat> hired as the summer pastor at our church, the Laverne Church of the Brethren. And one of the responsibilities was to work with the youth group. So we took everyone on a hike up on Mount Baldy. And Herb Hogan, who was uh, vice president and dean at the university at that time, came along with us. And on the way down the hill, he casually said to John, I wish you would reconsider. And John said, reconsider what? And Herb said, well, the campus minister job I offered to you last week on the telephone. And John said, you never talked to me on the phone last week. <laughs> and Herb said, but aren't you getting your doctorate at the Claremont Graduate School? And John said, yes. And aren't you studying theology? And John said, yes. And isn't law one of your special interests? And John said, no. <laughs> and Herb said, who is the person I offered to John? <laughs> no, no, no. He said, thank goodness he didn't accept. Uh, come in tomorrow morning and we'll talk about it. So John went in the next morning. He was hired and he stayed 37 years. <laughs> So gathered with me today are some of the closest friends John had at the university over those years. And they are going to introduce themselves and tell you about their relationship with John and his impact on the university. And I thank them all for being here with me today. So here on this cozy couch, the person <laughs> that we want to introduce first is the person right next to me, uh, Zandra. And uh, Zandra Wagner is now the uh, campus minister and uh, been the assistant professor of philosophy and religion at the University of Laverne, and also just a longtime family friend. Zand Zandra, mm -hmm. welcome to our comfortable, co cozy couch. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you for the invitation, Jackie. So I've known John most of my life as I grew up in the Laverne Church of the Brethren. Um, and I was friends with his oldest son, John, in youth group. And then I went to the University of Laverne for my bachelor's degree in religion. And John was my most significant professor and mentor. He introduced process theology to me when I was 19 years old. And to this day, I can remember the words and the hand motions he used to explain this radically different understanding of God, nudging us toward becoming. Most importantly, John taught me the value of my own learning. I was generally a straight A student and knew how to complete assignments and memorize and get A's. In my junior year, I took an independent study class with John and we met each week in his office for discussion. I did the work, but in the end, he gave me a B minus in that class and explained that he didn't see that I was invested in my learning. I wasn't engaged. I wasn't asking questions. There was no spark of excitement. It was a crushing moment, but it set me on a path to care about my own learning to discover the myriad questions that I had and explore radical and exciting ideas and theories and theologies. And it set me on course for striving for excellence 
as I went through seminary and my PhD. And when my learning and its uh, radical process related feminist theology got me into trouble with the denomination, John's mentorship and support was steady and wise and invaluable. In 2002, he hired me uh, at the University of Laverne to direct the general education program, which featured the core values that he helped to craft for the university and are still loved today, 25 years later. Um, and eventually I, I uh, became the university's chaplain, which was this role that John had um, so much earlier. And when I took on this role 11 years ago, John had already retired, but he enjoyed watching the university build a thriving interfaith culture. And he felt pride in this ever evolving shape of a position he once held. And his compliments were never gratuitous. His feedback was always a weather vane for me and a source of motivation and joy and direction. A couple months before he died, John had agreed to join me in an effort to apply for a $40,000 grant for the university to just help us reflect on our heritage, our values as a source of inspiration for the future. And he helped to shape that grant. And then we were awarded that grant, but John never knew that we got it. Today, we have 11 faculty and staff researching and writing about the university's Church of Brethren heritage, creating a more inclusive history that is even reflective about our predominantly white culture, and highlighting what core values from our heritage can inspire our future. He would have loved this unfolding and becoming, and I thank him for his ongoing legacy of a values-based institution. I miss John, his excellence, his gravitas, his wisdom, his humor, his presence at the university and in my own life. I'm ever grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Xander. I think we're ready next for um, Jonathan Reed, the one on the picture who's uh, got a halo. I think the only one to prove. <laughs> <laughs> Jonathan Reed is, uh, has been uh, dean and provost and professor of religion and a family friend. Jonathan? Great. Thank you very much. Highly ironic that I would have the halo here. Um, I, I was hired in 1992 by John Gingrich, and um, he was a great friend and a, and a mentor. And, and Jackie, you said something very interesting that I never knew about because I was uh, not his first choice to get the job. He offered the job to somebody else and after a couple <laughs> of weeks, uh, they turned it down and he needled me for my whole uh, career at the University of Laverne that he reminded me that I was number two, but he would often say that being number two is not so bad. So I, I never actually realized that we had something. He was in, number two also. He was number two. Uh, you, you learn something all, all the time. Um, I think what I appreciated most about John Gingrich is the way that he encapsulated different things and had perfect balance. Um, John Cobb said earlier that he was a great athlete and a great musician. And those two things don't often go together. Um, what I really appreciated about him was how he combined uh, incredible gravitas with a sense of humor. Um, I remember meetings that we would be in, tense meetings um, with faculty as, as things can go at a university. And his look, his look, his look of gravitas could kill. Uh, he could <laughs> shut down uh, a conversation. Um, but it would always be at the end afterwards, often with a self-effacing sense of humor, uh, that he could all make us laugh uh, at the same time and, and build community. Um, I believe his legacy um, at the University of Laverne is, is really remarkable. He took deeply held personal values that were part of the tradition of the Church of the Brethren, and he was able to translate those values and infuse them uh, into, into an institution um, that literally changed the institution. Uh, but they weren't just personal, traditional, and church values. Um, they were very progressive. They were very forward-looking. Uh, and they focused on the human condition and sustainability. 
um, all really a legacy to um, process theology and process philosophy. And I think as John Cobb said earlier, he was a great administrator. He would not have been able to do that um, and change the University of Laverne if he weren't the great administrator. Um, he created a GE um, whose legacy in, in different forms still continues. Um, and everyone knows that GE is really the battleground of faculty against each other and departments against each other. And somehow he got through an innovative, remarkable general education that's rooted in the core values of the Church of the Brethren uh, and heavily influenced by process uh, theology and process philosophy. And I think about, when I think about John, I often think about the hundreds of graduates uh, every year from the University of Laverne, um, thousands already, tens of thousands soon, um, who've been influenced by that general education uh, and by John Gingrich and, and the Church of the Brethren values and process philosophy, whether they know anything about either of them at all, uh, they've been heavily influenced by them. Okay, thank you, Jonathan. Uh, we now have the chance to hear from Steve Morgan, who was uh, President Emeritus and uh, Professor Emeritus of Educational Management, President Emeritus of University of Laverne. Steve? Well, I wasn't on the hike where Herb and John <laughs> talked, but I was there in 1968 and I met John. He and I were both starting our careers. He is a part time campus minister, and I was part time in the fundraising office at the University mm -hmm. of Laverne. And early on, we struck up a friendship and became longtime colleagues and friends. And as I talked to John, I talked about my own theology and my personal beliefs. And he looked at me, and that was early on. He said, you need to study process. That's going to be a perfect fit for you. I'm learning that from John Cobb, and I can teach you. So John Cobb, you planted seeds that 50 years later are still germinating in my life and many others. I learned quickly that John Kingrick was a man of values. And he didn't just hold those values, he wanted to live those values and he wanted to bring them to life. And he took them very seriously. As Jonathan alluded to, we would sit in meetings and you just watch John Gingrich's face. Mm. He disagreed with what was being said. The brow began to furrow <laughs> and he looked down his nose at you. And thought to myself, we better regroup here because we struck a nerve and we're going to pay for it if we don't address it right now. Because of his interest in values, he and I talked a lot about the liberal arts. We were both very interested in the liberal arts. We felt they were really the foundation for other disciplines or the majors of our students. And as Jonathan said, I looked at John one day and I said, John, we need to redo our general education requirements. And we need to bring the values of the Church of the Brethren into those. And we need to make sure our students learn how to live by those values. And John looked at me and said, Steve, that's a horrendous task. And if any of you have been around higher education, you know that developing general education requirements is something like developing a peace treaty in the Middle East. <laughs> Each department has its own interests and it protects them fiercely. John was the man to do the job and after a year of work with committees and departments, he created the general education requirements that Jonathan says there are still many parts of still alive at the University of Laverne. And he emerged from that with 50% approval rate, which is very high for a <laughs> and for someone who creates general education requirements. The second assignment I gave him that was extremely important, we needed to rewrite our mission statement. 
that's second only to creating new general education requirements in an educational institution. And John was the leader of that effort with a group of representative people from across the campus. And you can only imagine that it's something like functioning in the United Nations and bringing about a unanimous vote. And it wasn't exactly a unanimous vote, but he created a mission statement that incorporated the values. And he said to me, we have to live this. And we were validated when an accreditation team said to us, we've looked at a lot of mission statements, but you live yours. That was John. We're uh, ready now, I think, for uh, Richard Rose, who is a member of our uh, board of uh, directors of the Cobb Institute and is currently serving uh, as the chair of the religion and philosophy, uh, philosophy department at the University of Laverne. And uh, Richard Rose, glad you're here. Thank you. It is not only great to be here, but being in this space just brings back wonderful memories. And so I'm going to actually start there before I share my formal um, uh, statement here. We as a religion and philosophy department would come here uh, on many occasions and have our senior project presentations. Mm -hmm. And I think one of the things that comes forth from thinking about John Denver is his humility. Um, if you look at the space in which we are in, you'll realize that we're in one of the most nicest parts of the Claremont Hills and we're overlooking uh, the Great Valley and so forth. Very elegant, but John himself is such a humble gentlemen, easy to approach and to get along with. And so having someone who invited the entire department here to share in this experience is just something that I will never forget in the lasagna. So. <laughs> <laughs> Enough to make lasagna. <laughs> <laughs> Let me share that Dean John Gingrich is the one person uh, most responsible for mentoring me at the University of Laverne and therefore mentoring me through my academic career. A sincere thanks to him. Two things. While President Morgan, uh, the gentleman here to my left, is responsible for my appointment by hire, it was John Gingrich who worked through the political challenge of hiring someone to a tenure track position without a position being announced or a search being conducted. And it's too late now. <laughs> <laughs> Dean Ginger would often ask me uh, in recent years, are we going to establish a process major in the department? And my answer was always, I'm not sure, Dean, I'm not sure. It depends on the mood of the institution. Well, after having a sustainability studies major, almost approved on the books, and, and Dean Ginger really worked hard to bring this uh, to fruition. It was snagged by administrator Blair Tate. However, however, we've been revived and working with the natural sciences division, we've modified our proposal to satisfy those red tape concerns. And so the resolution uh, courses in our sustainability studies minor from the natural sciences will serve as area electives in our new major. Our four courses will remain basically the same with the ecology course added from the science division, the new ma major we hope to call Applied Sustainability. So it's a process relational way of understanding and living in the world that is applied to the curriculum for working in the real world of experience and learning. I think John would be very happy with this. And what John was, was saying by asking about the offering of a process philosophy major is that he would like to see undergraduate students exposed to the same way of relating to the world that he realized in process theology in his graduate work. We are well on our way at the University of Notre Dame. Thank you, John, for your question. Now, it's not in the script, but maybe some of you had some thoughts that came to your mind as others were speaking. And if, if you'd like to add a little something to what you've said before, I'd be glad to uh, recognize you for expanding this part of the conversation. 
if, if so, I'd, I'd be glad to honor that. Yeah, Alexandra, yeah? I'll say one thing. Um, as uh, Jonathan and Steve were mentioning, sort of John's presence at a meeting and how he uh, <laughs> had a sense of space. Um, and he only spoke when it was mm. me, right? He didn't overtake a meeting, but he, he often saved what he wanted to say till the very end of a meeting. Anyway, he had a great patience. And even today when I'm sitting in meetings and I say to myself, Xander, mm. just wait, be patient. I'm saying, be like John Gingrich. He, he mm. waited. He waited, and there was there was an appropriate time to say something. And um, it, it, anyways, it's been such a source of wisdom for me. Is any, anything else anybody would like to add? I learned things I didn't know. Oh, you did? <laughs> this was fun. <laughs> oh. We'd uh, maybe uh, this is a good time for another song. Uh, Jean, you have you have another one that you can introduce uh, if you'd like to say something. Yes, and and I'll also just tag on a little bit more about John as I introduce this next one. I think one of the themes I keep hearing is that John was yeah. a builder of people. Um, I think some of us felt personally built because of the opportunities he gave us. I didn't explicitly say before, but John hired me to be the choral director at the University of Laverne, which is why I live in California in the first place. Um, but also his belief in me, um, I think, led to lots of other things. Just sitting next to Jackie and looking out at the beautiful patio and garden makes me remember that the first time I ever articulated out loud, maybe I could become composer in residence for the LA Master Chorale was actually to one of our music department colleagues, uh, Dr. Kathy Lampkin, here in this yard. I just, and I think we should pay attention to the articulation of dreams. John Cobb talked about turning dreams into actuality. I think we should all pay attention to what dreams escape our lips, because I think we set up trend lines that we later prove true. But having people like John believe in us and create opportunities for us sets the stage for those things to unfold. Um, the Quakers have a term that they use for, I think, the kind of person we've been describing John as, which is, and pardon the humor, but a weighty friend, the Society of Friends. And I think John was a weighty friend. We've used the word gravity and gravitas. Um, so therefore, having the role of high priest, Caiaphas, um, the Laverne Church of the Brethren has always been a place where the arts can flourish because there's been a community of people who care about visual arts and, and music. And anyway, the St. Judas Passion, and I have my visual aid here of an original record. John was, you know, the right person to be cast <clears throat> this weighty role of Caiaphas. And however, you will hear it's a musical by the brilliant Steve Engel. And it, I never really paid attention to this until recently. My goodness, John could have had a Broadway career. Mm -hmm. Here, the incredible diction and delivery of this role, even just audio, you will be able to imagine this whole role coming to life. So um, you will also hear in the course of this solo, um, his sidekick, who is his father-in-law, Anas, A-N-N-A-S, um, but anyway, this is John in the role of Caiaphas for the St. Judas Passion that originated at the Laverne Church of the Brethren. Friend Judas, I have seen you before, but not among you. Brothers, the company you sometimes keep is quite a cut above the others. And this has been brief in me concerning your proposal. Be rest assured, both God and state are at your disposal. Take a chair. 
have a peach. They're uniquely sweet this season. We know that you're an honorable man and come here with good reason. Try a date. Taste a plum. The pomegranate's very fine. You can trust us. Just relax. Please feel free to speak your mind. Another babbling blot from hell. The rumors are spreading like vermin, but don't do much to fill out the map. At least I've never heard of more the flesh doing the things this man supposedly can. They say that he walks on water. But is he divine? Please give me the facts, friend Judas. The floor is yours, the ears are all mine. Isn't that something? It is really something. Um, I, I thought of one last thing I had to add because I, I, I honestly wonder if I have this in common with anyone else. There's a word that John used that I never heard another person say, but I wonder if he said it to some of you all. Um, you know, we're talking about him as a man of values, which means he's a man of uh, discernment also. Um, and he would sometimes criticize certain uh, church music or also other, other music in the concert hall as he pronounced it, pablum, P-A-B-U-L-U-M. I looked it up this morning in the dictionary just to make sure. Um, he, it, always, it always felt like he meant baby food, frankly, when it came out of his mouth, or pabulum or pablum. But anyway, he cared about quality, and he involved himself in good stuff. <laughs> May I make a word? Uh, my favorite story about you and John together is seeing you walking down the aisle of the church, ready to perform a piece. And you're saying over your shoulder to John, what key would you like to use this morning? And you are making up a key that you will use in 30 seconds in front of him. Well, yeah, I, I had the pleasure of playing for John many times, but there were some standards. And, and also, as someone ages, they don't always want the same key. Um, so anyway, I played, I think, the Lord's Prayer numerous times for memorial services for friends and also O Holy Night. And I play by ear, therefore I can adjust. So I, I played for John in lots of different keys and he sounded great in all of them. It was always amazing. Yeah. Well, thank you. Uh, so we've covered uh, two of the three gifts that we're highlighting for uh, John Gabriel. We've covered the uh, educational gift, we've covered the musical and arts gift, and uh, we want to concentrate in this next section on uh, his theology and uh, his, uh, his, his faith, his spirituality. And it's deeply connected with the process of theology that John Cobb has been connected with. Uh, Jay McDaniel, uh, you are joining us uh, from uh, Arkansas, where you've been uh, faculty teaching world religions, among other things, at uh, Hendricks College in Conway, Arkansas. And uh, we haven't officially uh, announced you as such, but I understand you're going to be the next chairman of the board of the uh, Cobb Institute beginning the 1st of January. That's right. Uh, John Fahey, who was uh, the person who took up the baton uh, from John uh, Gingrich, 
was unable to be with us uh, because of, uh, unfortunately, he has to attend that same meeting that John Cobb is involved in. But um, John Fahey would um, want to be sure to know uh, how much he enjoyed all those conversations uh, with John Gingrich that kind of helped him to understand what, what it was about to be a chairman of the board. And I think um, John Gingrich was grooming John Fahey for that task because John Fahey is uh, experience in uh, kind of the, all the world of, of media and uh, the Silicon Valley kind of world that John just says, you can help us to understand that. So uh, we're soon to be in a transition from uh, John Fahey as uh, chairman of our board to uh, Jay McDaniel. But Jay, we want you to help us to uh, work through um, some of the uh, theology and, and the spirituality that was uh, John uh, Kingrick's gift. And so I'll just turn it over to you and you can uh, introduce the resources that we'll be using for this. Well, thank you so much. And can everyone hear me? Yeah, we hear you. That's great. Do you um, look good? Oh, well, thank you. Thank you. Um, it's so nice to be here, and it's so good to see the Gingrich family and Jackie in particular, but all the friends. And so we're just honored to be able to honor John. And uh, as it happens, my real name is John, so fear not. Uh, we've got John Cobb, John Gingrich, John Fahey, and John McDaniel. We're continuing the John lineage. But I don't know that I can ever... Uh, match John Gingrich, and I, I'll, I'll give it a try. But he 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 was a wonderful human being, as we all know, and and he was good to me. Um, and when I first got involved with the Cobb Institute, uh, I had some health issues, and I you know I live in Arkansas, so I thought, well, now, who can I contact uh, that I can just talk to this about and explain that I might not be as involved with the Cobb Institute as in fact I can be, I realize. Well, I thought of John Cobb and John Fahey and Ron Hines and all kinds of people, but John Gingrich was the one that I called. And I sensed in, in him the, the times that I got to be with him, not only a rock-like a, a rock presence uh, full of strength, but kind of a pastoral side a side that could receive people from where they were coming and, and welcome them. And he did that for me and I'm forever grateful to him for that. Now I need also to tell you, don't worry, we're gonna hear some more music. And um, as I watch you on the screen, as, as John sings, it's just so powerful, so incredible. And I wanna draw just a little link between process theology and music. Uh, you may or may not know that process theology is, is influenced by the philosophy of Alfred North Whitehead. And Whitehead thought that feeling, something like feeling is everywhere. Feeling is another name for energy. And wherever there's energy of any sort, it has an emotional quality to it. This is in the, na in the natural world as well as in human life. So in a way, music, is what feelings sound like. If we ask the question, what is music? What is melody? What is rhythm? Well, it's, it's an acoustic articulation of a kind of energy, a kind of feeling that's part of the universe and dare I say, part of God. And so when you hear music, when we hear John sing in particular, it's the diction to be sure, it's the melody to be sure, it's the, it's the rhythm to be sure, but it's the soulfulness. We hear a kind of soulfulness in John's voice and we hear it and we feel it. That's process theology. Process theology is honoring uh, the soulfulness in things. In other people, yes. The natural world, yes. And what a medium music is for communicating that soulfulness. So yes, John was a process theologian. He was as much a theologian when he sang as when he talked. 
he was communicating what I would take to be part of the very heart of process theology. But John's passion, as you know, was also in some way to get process theology into local congregations. And you, know, you may know that whenever you go to take a course in process theology, there will be ministerial students in the classes. And, and they will always raise their hand and they will say, thank you so much. These are very interesting ideas. And if they're gonna be ministers, they say, but is it preachable? Is it preachable? Is process theology accessible in the local church? John was very, very interested in that question. So to get a feel for how he communicated the verbal side of process thought in a local congregation, we're going to uh, give you two samples. And one is a PowerPoint created by Ron uh, Hines that John, that uh, expresses, uh, that uses John's words, John Gingrich's words. And the second is we'll get to hear John Gingrich uh, preach part of a sermon, just a part of it. And then we'll do some talking, see what we think. So Ron, the PowerPoint first. Yeah, did you want me to narrate that or are you gonna do that? Why don't you do that? All right, uh, you understand I had about um, 10 pages of script from his three classes that he was teaching on the theme, A Different God. And uh, what we're sharing with you is uh, just the, uh, a little bit from the last class that he taught uh, at the uh, Laverne Church of the Brethren. This was particularly on October the 13th in 2019. So the next slide uh, will uh, take you to the church, which was home for uh, John for uh, many years, Church of the Brethren at Laverne. And uh, Jackie might like for you to know that that cross up there at the top was, was her idea. She said, do that. We need a flag like that on our church. <laughs> but um, a lot of people helped make it come to be. It, it, it's interesting, the website of this church advertises itself as a, a progressive church with a pipe organ. <laughs> <laughs> and I like the peace poll there that says something about the, the historic peace tradition of this uh, Church of the Brethren. The next slide shows us the inside of the church, in which God, uh, this is actually from this, the second uh, session that he was explaining. We're talking about God as uh, relational. So we experience God in the world relationally. And um, so this is uh, some of the key in concepts he was sharing. Everything is relational. We live in an interdependent world. How my kids and friends feel shapes how I feel. This church enters into me and I enter into it. I think it was that sentence that inspired me to go hunting for a picture of the inside of the church of the Laverne. This is children's story time and the congregation is gathered. To exist is to be in relation. Everything affects everything else. God is also relational. And the next slide will um, experience God with a difference is the way I've titled what John did in that third session. And the next slide will uh, give you some of the key phrases uh, about this God with a difference in a process theology. God is persuasive, not controlling power. And that means that creativity requires a partnership. This process theology rejects supernaturalism. And uh, it also rejects, uh, you know, it accepts uh, universal salvation as opposed to giving rewards or punishments based on whether you kept God's rule book. And um, this also sees God as a lover who is affected by what we do, not the unchanging God. <clears throat> But a God, because of God's love, is ever uh, responding to, uh, to us and is affected by what we do. And God is not the keeper of the status quo, and certainly God's not male, in spite of some of the traditions in some of our churches that leaders ought to be male. 
that that seemed to be a theme that John re reiterated some times before. The next slide. God then is a lure for evolution. Uh, some of our churches, uh, people are kind of nervous about evolution, but uh, John uh, sees that science can explore God's lure into novelty, and in fact, that God delights in diversity. God does not know the future because our choices matter in shaping the future. And God is universally at work. You don't have to be Christian in order to be saved. So that's um, some of what John was sharing in that third session about this God with a difference. Jay, that's all we've got from- this. Thank you so much, Ron, for pulling that together. And I think the second part um, of this component of our session is we'd like to hear John. And we'd like to hear John in church. And we'd like to hear John giving a sermon. It won't be the whole sermon. It'll be the last part of it. Um, here goes, Richard, if you could play that. It may seem to you that I'm saying that God doesn't have anything to do with what's going on in the world. It's true that I don't think God coercively breaks into the normal functioning of our lives with a miracle or two to impress us or to scare us. On the contrary, I believe that God is constantly giving us hints about how we are to use our decision-making ability. I think that God is involved in every event and thought that we have. But God's power is persuasive, not coercive. God lures us into increased harmony and to work for the common good through our minds, our dreams, our friends, our reading, our meditation, our prayers, our worship, our serious discussions, our service to our neighbor. If we are reflective and open we can discern these God-given given nudges. A word of caution. This morning I've chosen to emphasize loving God with our minds. However, the scripture mentions that Jesus names two other ways of loving God, through our hearts and our souls. Our rational del deliberations, important as they are, are not sufficient by themselves. My mind is but one of the three aspects of loving God. My understanding is that our hearts involve our emotions and maybe a mystical experience as well. For me, the music experience here on a Sunday morning fits into that category. But what about the soul, loving God with your soul? I'm not so sure about explaining this one, but for me, loving God with my soul means loving God with my whole being, my identity, my true self. Perhaps you can help me understand that one more adequately. If loving God with our minds involves becoming a theologian, that is, a person who tries to discover and articulate one's beliefs, some cognitive effort is needed. Obviously, discussion with friends or family in an atmosphere of sharing and mutual acceptance is a place to start. I know, I know, we're not supposed to discuss politics or religion around the table, but if we take the risk, I believe that we can, uh, and without assuming that all of our, that we have all the answers, and with the thought that we truly believe we can learn from each other, it might be worth the effort. 
Perhaps a connect group might provide a context for discussion of our beliefs and our doubts. Reading books or periodicals that challenge us might also be a possibility. There are many ways to broaden and expand our thinking about our beliefs. All right. We've seen how John teaches what he says and we've heard him preach, which was also such a, such a great teaching. And John, obvious. Oh, by the way, I don't think you need to go to church ever again in your entire life. Uh, because the sermon you just heard is sufficient, sufficient to the cause. Uh, it's so good. It, it, it includes so much that's important. But as you know, the last thing that John would want would be for us to uh, in lockstep nod our heads and say, yes, I agree. That's exactly right. Thank you so much. Answer given. I'll move on. Uh, John wants people to talk. He wants people to explore together. He wants people to discuss. He doesn't want there to be a final answer. He wants the journey to continue. So I, I'll tell you the questions that came to my mind and we can talk about them now. And also wanna give you a chance to tell you, to, for you to share the questions or the thoughts that came to your mind as you heard John. I was struck by his recognition that there are three ways um, to love God, whatever God means. And, and one is with your mind, and one is with your heart, and one is with your soul. And I think John and many others appreciate process theology because it really does enable people to imagine God in ways that they find persuasive and intellectually plausible, helpful, true, and thus love God with their minds. But then John turned to the question of loving God with your heart and he linked it with emotions and he linked it with music. And he said, that's a place where I experienced God in a different way. Now, I've known a few people that go to church that don't quite believe what the church teaches, but they go for the music, they go for the friendships, they go for the community. And so here was a question that emerged for me, perhaps for you as well. Is it possible that to love God with your with your heart, but not be sure what you believe in your mind? Is it possible to know God in some way at an emotional level, but not to believe or know what you believe with your mind? That's one question that emerged for me. Another was, is it possible to believe in God with your mind, but not know God with your heart? Is it possible to kind of have all the right beliefs, so to speak, whatever they are? But at an emotional level, at a heart level, there's not the connect. So you can flip that. And then, you know, at the end, uh, John says, um, now loving God with your soul, that's a little different. What does that mean? And he, he actually... Uh, threw the question back uh, at the congregation. He said, here's kind of what it means to me, your whole identity, but, but what do you think? So in the spirit of John, I, I, I throw the questions to you, to us as a group right now. Uh, what do you think? Can some people love God with their hearts, but not with their minds? Might some people love God with their minds, but not with their hearts? And what in the world does it mean to love God with your soul? Any thoughts? And by the way, I'm a former teacher like John, so I will call on people. 
I'm not going to call him. Okay. Let me just uh, comment that um, it might be especially helpful since we have a lot of new folks today. If you um, want uh, to make a comment, use the reaction button and raise your hand, and then it'll be easy to identify that you'd like to speak next. And Jay, Jay I'll let you be the teacher that calls on whoever raises their hand. Okay. All right. So anybody have, so let's take the first one. Can you love God with your heart, but not with your mind? Anybody have a thought on that one? Pat? Uh, well, you, you must have seen that I was reacting to that, even though I was on mute. Uh, I think I see many people who haven't figured out a way to translate the creeds of the church in a way that makes sense to them and makes common sense but they know they're they know they're in love with the world and with others and they are wanting to be a positive link in that process mm -hmm. and so yes i i have many friends that i cherish because of their love and affirmation for mm -hmm. the world and for others mm -hmm. don't have a theology mm -hmm. thank you so much pat um, anybody else want to speak to this question? Jay, let me go ahead and, and say that I think um, it is possible to love God with one's um, heart and not fully understand how God is being communicated in the doctrine and so forth. And so, um, yeah, there can be some uncertainty with regard to the nature of God, but yet there's still a connection knowing that I belong to whatever that thing might be. Thanks, Richard. Mm -hmm. And you know, for some people, the very word God is off-putting. Uh, it, it cannot be dissociated in their minds from a kind of bully in the sky. And, and as much as they would like to dis, might, might like to disentangle the word God from that image, it's pretty hard. And so for them, what they love may not, may not be associated with that name, but still there's the love. Let's go to the third question, if, if you don't mind. And, and what might it mean for a person to love the mystery, to love God with their soul? And I know you might want to say, well, by the way, would you define soul first? Mm. <laughs> uh, but I won't. Uh, whatever soul means to you, that's fine. Um, what might it mean to love God with, with your soul? Anybody have a thought on that? Yeah, we got one here in the room, Sean. Yeah, All right. not, not wanting to take from the great cloud of witnesses that we have with us today, but I can't help but have a musical uh, inspired response to this. Um, for some reason, the idea of the soul makes me think about the here and now. Mm. And being in the here and now makes me think about the essence of improvisation. Uh -huh. And I also like to think about evolution as God's improvisation, mm -hmm. but also my image of Jesus's genius actually was as master improviser mm -hmm. who knew the right thing in every moment, but you can only know the right thing if you're truly in the moment, in the here and the now, and someone that's improvising at the keyboard doesn't actually know what's going to happen next because you're waiting for the next to arrive <laughs> and it's going to come in a split second and but then there's going to be another now that arrives in the next second so there's a sense of the wholeness in each moment that's expanding into the wholeness in the next moment a, a direction that's offered with a question mark and you follow mm -hmm. or in a conversation someone puts out one little phrase and your mind says oh i see where this person is leading or something mm -hmm. in the so in my compassionate listening, we take it down this route. I mean, for me, just life as improvisation in the here and now is 
perhaps what it means to me to love God with one's soul. Mm. Well, Sean, I, I think you, you just gave a great sermon on the process understanding of the whole universe. Mm -hmm. Because in, in, in process thought, the whole universe is improvisational. Uh, and it always occurs in the now. It always occurs in the now. But I think that your description of that also in human life. And so I'd like to ask you a question as a musician. I'm sure you love to improvise. And I think in a certain way, when you said to John, what key? <laughs> That was an invitation in that moment. Well, how about this? Um, Sean, do you think you can, how do we help other people improvise too? And what role does listening or, or mindfulness or compassionate presence play in our creating spaces where others can also improvise in that joyful way? Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I do. Because I'm, I'm in the world of creativity and inspiration for a living, but also as a life. Um, I have a little phrase I like to use with people that your creativity will save you. Um, and I think it's completely true, but I also think that each of us has to find what our creativity is. Is it crafts? Is it cooking? Is it hospitality? But I think that whenever each person enters into that sphere of what is creative for them in their own aptitudes and their own interests, I think suddenly there's a, a playfulness and a timelessness. Oh, where'd the time go? I, I, I was busy doing that puzzle that I love, so, you know, or, or whatever it might be, or playing with my grandkids. Um, I think our playfulness is very connected to our particular creativity. Mm. But I, I do think that everyone has that. For me personally, I call it the river, because mm. my piano is just sitting there. I never put the keyboard cover down on my piano at my house. It's always open, so I can just walk by because the river is there. So I can yeah. always dip into the river. But I think everyone has their own river. It's, mm. it's where do you find your creativity and your passion and your play? And, and I think people also do themselves a disservice to think, oh, I'm not an artist like them. I'm not good like them. I'm not trained. Everyone has their own path to their own creativity, which means to their own improvisation, I feel. Um, that's how I would answer well, you know, I love that that image of the river, and I, I wonder if one of the functions, not the only function, but one of the functions of liberal arts education is to help people find their rivers, um, to find their own capacities for that playfulness, that improvisation, that joy for living. I'm not sure you could build that into the mission statement. Uh, Jonathan has something he'd like to say. Please. L listening to Sean, just it, it kind of made me think back to John's personality. I, I think he had some pretty good answers himself to that question, how do you love God with your soul? But for him, a sermon wasn't a statement. It was, it was the sermon was the beginning of a conversation in community. Um, what you were alluding to, I'm thinking of Jesus and the parables. I, I really would have loved to hear his thoughts because I'm pretty sure they were good, but it, it's just typical of him to be kind of self-effacing and open it up to others and and keep the keep a conversation going rather than just making a declarative statement. Anybody else that uh, thank you uh, all of you. Anybody else something you just want to say from what from this third component? Uh, Al Gephardt. Uh, has uh, his hand up, Al? Yeah, for me, uh, soul has um, something to do with sort of totality of my being. It's a kind of a wholeness or um, all the aspects of who I am, physical, mental, spiritual. Um, I think that there are people who, ex who experience God, but who may not be able to name it. And, and here I'm, I'm thinking of, um, of a line in Rebecca Parker's poem on winter solstice, where she writes, stunned to silence by beauty. Mm -hmm. and, and I think there are 
there are many times uh, in our life experience when we're overwhelmed by a moment, um, the birth of a child, the beautiful um, vista or a sunset or a, a, or a piece of music, and it touches the totality of our being. And that to me seems to be um, um, the response of our soul to the great beauty that is gone. Thanks, Al. Thank you. Luann. Yes, I'm, I'm um, learning some things about process theology today that I didn't know. Um, in my work with couples, I'm a couples therapist, you know, I'm, I'm thinking about the two of them meeting each other as souls. You know, the, the, the two souls are meeting each other in a kind of relational kind of thing. And what we're trying to teach is that very thing is, you know, how to stay in the here and now, how to listen to each other, how to know, you know, what the mind, heart, and soul are saying and what their relationship is with God. Mm -hmm. I just, just wanted to say that, that I think that makes a whole lot of sense in terms of the work that I do with couples. Thanks. Thank you so much. Mm -hmm. Jackie would like to make a comment. So Jackie Gingrich. I, I just wanted to comment on Al's talking about being stunned to silence by music because that happened to me twice on Saturday when I listened to Sean's music. I, at the end, I just wanted everyone to stay absolutely still. And yet, as I wrote to him later, I still wanted the thunderous applause to recognize his accomplishment, but I often feel that with music. And speaking of Jackie, um, I think it's time for us to hear John again. Um, and so I think we turn now to the conclusion of this part. And I wanna say, I think we did a pretty good job of being in conversation, which is what John would want. John would want. Thank you, Jay. So uh, we'll, uh, first of all, uh, listen to um, this one more song. And then, uh, but I think, uh, Jackie, would you like to maybe say a, a word of, about the, the, what we've done here and kind of thank folks for their participation before we do that? And then I have a benediction that was given by uh, John at the church. And so we'll include that as well. Absolutely. I really want to thank all of you who have joined us, uh, whether you joined us in other states and other parts of, of the world even, and those who especially have joined us here in the family room today. Thank you so much for your contribution and for telling me more about John. And I want to thank the planning committee. I want to thank uh, John Fahey and uh, Jay McDaniel and also Richard Livingston who helped all this come together and but we wouldn't be here without you. And I especially want to thank Ron Himes who had the idea of honoring John today and for making so, so much of this come together with your work. You spent many, many hours and I appreciate it. I just want to say to all of you that most mornings, uh, I sit on the patio and I look out and I say the same question every day. John, where are you and what are you experiencing? And I hope that somehow he knows that we still love him and that we're trying to make his ideas and dreams come true. I just want to share a word. Uh, one of the people on our board is uh, uh, Kathleen uh, Kathleen Reeves, and uh, she had sent a special note. She was not sure if she'd be able to actually share it with us, but she just uh, wanted to let us know that John was such a thoughtful man, but in a quiet and unassuming way. He often sent me simple little thank you notes for the things I did for the Cobb Institute. And then she, she lists them. I won't read all of them, but sometimes just, just a sentence. But that, uh, that sentence from John that says, uh, thank you, appreciate your good work, hang in there. 
uh, and from uh, another of the members of uh, our board. Uh, Jackie's asked me to introduce the last song, Sean, uh, because it's a part of the tradition I grew up with. Uh, he's singing, Blessed Assurance, Jesus is mine. Oh, what a foretaste of glory divine. And uh, it has something, uh, the, the process theology is not quite so explicit in it, but certainly the, the soul uh, that, that has been a part of uh, the tradition he inherited is a, a part of it and is an expression of uh, a sheer joy and the, uh, the assurance that, that we have that connection to this God who is ever creative and uh, allows us to keep the uh, cover on our piano open so there's always another river of melody coming. Uh, John, uh, sing for us this Blessed Assurance song. Perfect submission, perfect delight, visions of rapture now burst on my sight. Angels descend. From above, echoes of mercy, whispers of love. This is my story. This is my song. listen to the end of that sermon that John preached and uh, the benediction for the service in which he preached it. And it doesn't mean you all have to go. Uh, if you want to hang around, I think the folks here are willing to hang around and talk a little bit more for another half hour if you'd like. But uh, we wanted to honor those who need to leave at 1130. And so, uh, Richard, can you play for us that... Uh, just a couple of little snippets of John's closing word for his sermon and for the service. Love God with your mind. Become a more aware theologian. Become a thinking Christian. Amen. So when you come to church, bring along your brain, but also your heart and your soul. 
perhaps that will lead to loving your neighbor as well. Amen. Well, I'm willing to hang in here if anybody wants to talk some more. If some of you need to leave, you're welcome to leave. But uh, if you want to, if you uh, want to hang in with us again, if you if you use the raised hand function, uh, we'll be able to better recognize that you'd like to say something. John Sonneborn, I see your hand. Yes, <clears throat> it was a reference to special moments, right? in connection with Jesus was raised. And this raises the question of, is there a change from more and more quantity into something called quality? Uh, Marxism teaches that there is a change. A philosopher that I like generally and whose two books I've um, Finalized the translation into English, Sang Hong Yi argues against it. He said the transition from water to steam is just one more molecule, with no particular point. In other words, it's only uh, epistemological. And we recognize it as steam, or the person won't, depending upon the labor pressure fraction. However, uh, once you put in the word enough, I think that falsifies that. Because what we're looking for is enough steam to move a piston or whatever it has to do, or enough people to take over the assembly as Lenin put, had, and enough people to support him once he was there, which he didn't have. But I'm wondering how this will all be expressed in process thought. Uh, is just the transition, one more or the accumulation of outcomes or something like that? Or is there a positive change? Okay, thank you, John. Uh, some of you maybe have joined just because you're part of the extended family for uh, Jackie and uh, John or uh, members of the church. If you'd like to, to just raise your hand using that uh, reactions button at the bottom, Oh, we'd love to hear from you, and um, many of you have already written in the chat so that you have sent your greetings so that um, Jackie will be able to see uh, that you've been here and uh, appreciate your presence. Yes, I see um, Eileen. Eileen. Um, whew, all of a sudden it got to me. Um, John was my brother, and um, I think I've known him longer than any of you. I met him in 1945, <laughs> and he was my brother. I knew him as a musician. I knew him as a professor, because I too taught in college. But this has been so enlightening, because I never really knew him as a theologian. And um, I just thank you all for kind of opening this window for me into all what was very dear to his heart. And I thank you. And I want to talk. All right, talk. Because <laughs> I'm also a sister of John. Okay. I'm his older sister. And he was very, very instrumental in really bringing about a group called Celebration, which existed for maybe 10 or 15, well, probably 20 years in Eastern, uh, in, in Washington, DC. And we had about uh, 45 members and, uh, John was the one who really gave us the theology that we carried with us for many years and still do inside of our hearts. So I just wanted to talk about that uh, contribution he had made to our families and the people in our community. Thank you. Uh, who, who's, who'd like to make another comment? 
or, or any, anybody in the room here want to make another comment? You're welcome to. Yeah, yes. Julie, uh, Julie Kurtz. Julie Kurtz. Yeah, Julie. Nothing, nothing profound, just that we didn't have him long enough. We wanted Tim around a whole lot longer. That's all. That's pretty profound. Mm -hmm. I'll jump in here as well. Uh huh. Um, hey everyone. Uh, so uh, you know, my reflection of of hearing all the sharing here is that my dad would be really proud of the network uh, that uh, uh, that that he um, that he had of the shared um, experiences and relationships, and uh, you know his um, uh, his his desire to kind of challenge everyone, um, but to challenge everyone in a way that made sense to them, that was good for our communities, it was good for the world. Um, and uh, he certainly had that impact on me and uh, I can see that in, in others here. So uh, it's just, it's really nice to hear everyone's reflections. It's, uh, it's great, he, he, would be, uh, he would be happy uh, that he had this type of uh, impact and that we're coming together a year after uh, his, his passing um, and still have um, um, kind of his uh, a lot of his influence in our lives. So thank you. Thank you, John. Hi, this is uh, John Fahey. I, I just wanted to break away from my other meeting here and- uh, Great, just, good to see you, John. Well, great to see you all. Great to see John Gingrich again. Um, good to see you, John. Um, yeah, I just wanted to express how uh, good it is to see everybody and how uh, what a huge part of my experience in Claremont John Gingrich was. And I tried to not speak today because I knew I would cry, Jackie, if I started talking about John Gingrich. So I really want to say thank you to the whole Gingrich family and, and for letting John Gingrich be, be a part of my life. It was very, very uh, important. So thank you. Uh, maybe, John, uh, you take this opportunity to share a, a uh, word that you had from uh, Albert Schweitzer that you were uh, thinking that if you could begin the program, you might begin the program with that, and you were not able to do that. But you said that Albert Schweitzer said, at times, our own light goes out and is rekindled by a spark from another person. Each of us has cause to think with deep gratitude of those who have lighted the flame within us. And uh, John uh, Fahey wanted to share that as a testimony to the flame that's been lit by uh, John Fahey and, I mean, John Gingrich in John Fahey's life and in the lives of many of us. Indeed. Uh, <laughs> another, uh, it's easy for me to see your raised hand and uh, I don't have all the pictures on the screen in front of me on the wall. Uh, you, you, by the way, need to give a, a huge hurrah for Richard Livingston, the genius who, who is turning this living room into a studio where you can see us all. Anybody else? Kevin yeah, Kevin Clark, tuning in from uh, way up north in Washington State. Kevin? Hi. Um, I... Um, I didn't know John, uh, he got to the School of Theology before I did, and I think was gone. And I didn't uh, appreciate uh, John's um, great accomplishments uh, that, uh, that I've heard about here this morning. I, am, I mostly uh, remember him from the last few years when um, we met in Claremont around the Cobb Institute and from a few conferences where we were together. But um, he was an amazing person, um, as we have seen this morning. Um, the word gravitas has been mentioned and everyone has expressed those feelings. And Jay said soulfulness. Um, in the process world, we talk about a fat soul. And um, John was an amazingly inclusive person. It's sort of an ideal of what 
what God, how inclusive God is for the process world. Um, John, as I have learned today, encompassed so many talents and perspectives and sensitivities. Um, I wish I had known him more and better, um, but he was a, always a quiet presence. Um, and as I, I forget um, the, uh, the woman who is uh, sitting on the couch, who is the uh, um, chaplain uh, said, you know, he only spoke, you know, um, sort of at the end or very quietly, but, you know, uh, from a sense of his own um, um, deep feeling. And um, I remember that about him well. And I'd like to know more about John's theology and um, hear more of his musical expressions, if that is possible. Um, I, I think if we could put that up somehow online, I, I guess, um, Ron, you've done a lot of investigation and work about, about John and his life. So maybe if more of that could be shared online, um, I'd like to keep learning from John. Thank you. Thank you, Kevin. You'd be interested in that little snippet of a slideshow I did from his three courses uh, is a part of a larger work. And uh, I shared that with a group of our folks at Pilgrim Place. And they really appreciated getting involved with what he was thinking about. So I think there's a future for some of this uh, material. And uh, so thank you for your encouragement. Uh, does the woman on the couch want to say anything? <laughs> okay. <laughs> Any, anything else? I, I don't see anybody trying to get my attention. And um, we had a, oh, yeah, oh, Richard. No, I was just going to say. Oh, Richard affirms he doesn't see anybody else yeah. trying to get my attention <laughs> either. <laughs> you, all, exactly. you all just be amazed at what a wizard Richard is. He just came in and transformed uh, this television into our studio and it's, it's... we'll let you take a peek behind the curtain oh there, <laughs> oh, there you go you can wave, wave at richard and say thank you I, I, oh jackie okay, i, I, I just wanted word. to say again thank you to everyone for being here and being part of this i send my love to you all all right i think that sounds like our benediction for the morning thank you all for your participation <laughs>